Man, I tell you what, I uh, just recently took my wife and daughter to the airport. Uh, they are flying to Texas. They've already flown. It doesn't take this long, really, to fly. But uh, they flew to Texas to start looking at colleges. I know, right? It's like, I'm not ready for this. this is, it's like it's too soon. It's way, way too soon, right? Uh, and, but anyway, so we, we are driving uh, down Maple Valley Highway, get to 405, hop onto 405. And as soon as we get onto 405, uh, obviously the traffic, apparently they're doing some construction. So who knew, right? Uh, so anyways, there's a lot of traffic on 405. And then finally, what do my wandering eyes should appear? But I see this beautiful, amazing, wonderful, incredible sign, right? Uh, HOV lane. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm hopping over there because there's nobody in it. And so I get into the HOV lane and we just keep on going. We fly and we get there all the way to uh, the airport and then drop them off, hugs and kisses on the way out and then uh, start making my way back home. And as I'm making my way back home, more traffic and another empty HOV lane. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, it's just such a shame that there's this one huge lane that nobody's using. Wouldn't it be nice if I alleviated some of the congestion that is currently taking place in these lanes and just hopped on over into the HOV lane and drove. Now, the downside of the course is that I'm not HOV. I don't have a high occupancy vehicle. It's just me in the vehicle at the time, right? Uh, and so because I actually, uh, more often than not, uh, choose the right thing, I decided not to get in the HOV lane because there's actually a hefty fine that comes with driving in the HOV lane when you are driving by yourself. Uh, not that some people don't try to get around it or try to figure out ways to make it seem like they're traveling with companions. Uh, for example, um, <laughs> this person thought, uh, well, this looks enough like a human being that surely that'd be fan. I'll just use that, uh, that mannequin there. Uh, this person right here is like, no, don't worry about her. She's, you know, passed out. It's, it's, it's okay. Uh, it'll be fine. Uh, someone decided that they wanted to ride with the most interesting man in the world which is great, right? That's pretty fantastic. I don't always break the law, but when I do, I get a hefty fine for it because that's just how it works, right? I'm not sure why someone chose this one as an option. <laughs> it just seems like you'd just be getting madder and madder as you're driving down the road, right? Why would you do that necessarily? Anyways, but this one right here, this is my favorite. Um, uh, it's like you're not even trying, Right, it's like you're just, I know I'll probably get a ticket, but it'll be so cute, right? It'll be one of those, it'll be a cute, uh, cute moment. Uh, and so it just got me to thinking, it's like, so, the, you know, we travel a lot in this area and we've got a lot of HOV lanes. If you had an opportunity to select one person from history, can't be Jesus, can't be a Bible figure, all right? Uh, someone from history that you do not know, that you're not related to, uh, that you could drive in a car in an HOV lane. You could drive in the car with them. You have an opportunity to talk. You get to find out more about who they are. You get to more you ask questions. Who would you ride with and why? So turn to somebody next to you. Tell them who you would choose as your HOV lane partner and why you would choose them. And if you need a minivan for this exercise, you can, you know, get a bunch of people. You can do that, too. All right. Who are some of the people that you chose? Just, just shout it out. Who are some of the people that you chose? Tim Allen. Tim Allen. Awesome. Who? Lincoln. Lincoln. Good. Who else? James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones. Because, man, you know, I need you to turn left. All right? I mean, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Who, who else? Huh? Desmond Tutu, fantastic. Who else? Alexander Ham. <laughs> What's his name, man? Who else? Sacagawea. Okay, fantastic. That'd be great. Who else? Robin Who? Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Good, good, good. What else? Jim Rome. Because you wouldn't get a word in, right? I mean, he'd be talking the whole time. That'd be good. good. What else? Anybody else? Huh? Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger. Okay, good choice. Good choice. Anybody else? Huh? Lincoln, okay. Uh, JFK, fantastic. Hey, if it was me, I, I would, and this is, 
it's, it's just me, right? So if it was me, I, I'm thinking I'd probably want to ride in the car with James Corden. Because I'm thinking we'd do carpool karaoke like the whole way, <laughs> wherever we're going, right? Uh, it wouldn't be much fun as far as the conversation goes, I'm sure. But anyways, it'd be fun to sing along with. Anyway, uh, so, so here's the truth. Here's what we know to be true, right? Uh, you not, can't necessarily choose your family. Some of you are in a family that's like, if I had a choice, if I could choose another family, I would have chosen these other family, right? I can't always choose your family. I can't always choose Circumstances come and go, and sometimes we have no control over our circumstances. But here's what we, we can choose the people that we ride with. We can choose the people that we're going to be talking to. We choose the, tra- the traveling companions that we have along the way. Uh, and we're going to try to figure out how can we make our relationships better? How can we make them stronger? How can we make better choices when it comes to the people that we ride with? How can we make uh, better choices in the way that we communicate with each other? Uh, we're going to talk about the choices that we make in the way husbands and wives communicate with each other, the way that parents and children communicate with each other, and the way that we communicate with uh, people that we would consider to be our friends. And so we're going to talk about this whole concept of choices, because ultimately, these choices determine the quality of our relationships. The choices that we make determine how well we interact one another. So today, I want to talk about is this slide. Make sure that we choose our travel companions wisely. Choosing our travel companions wisely. Craig Rochelle, pastor in a church in Oklahoma, said this. He said, show me your friends, and I will show you your, your future. If you show me your friends, I will show you your future. Uh, Andy Stanley put it this way. He said, your friends will determine the direction and the quality of your life. You know that? Your friends determine the direction and the quality of your life. Now, if you're a parent, you know this to be true, right? Uh, when you were growing up, if you're a parent, you grew, you're growing up, you remember your parents, and even if you're a parent, you remember your parents when you were growing up, and you remember how, hopefully, at that level, how they were so people that you hung out with. And they wanted to make sure you the right job because they knew that this type of concept of, of the people that you hang out with, that's going to determine the direction and the quality of your life. And so they wanted to make sure that you're hanging out with good people. And if they found out any of your friends weren't good people, well, you just can't go over to so-and-so's house anymore, right? Because they're a bad influence on you. Uh, or, or maybe it's like, hey, uh, you, we, we want you to make sure that you're, you're going, uh, hanging out with this crowd over here, making sure you're going to this place over here. Uh, even growing up, there was times where you'd go, uh, well, I, we, maybe we need to get out of the school and we'll go to another school and we'll, we'll go to a private school or we'll go to a, another place or we'll even move. If your parents could have, they would have arranged your marriage for you, right? It's like they, they wanted complete and total control of the entire situation. Why? Because they knew that the, the way that you spent your life and the people that you surrounded with was going to determine the direction and the quality of your life. And we thought they were crazy until we became parents. And when I became a parent, all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, 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 okay. I knew what I acted like. I knew how I acted and the friends that I hung out with. But with my kids, it's like I'm always just trying to make sure that they're influenced by people, right, people who are going to help them because I know it to be true. Their friends will determine the direction, and the quality of their life. But today it's a lot easier too, right? Because, I mean, now we've got like electronic surveillance uh, that we keep with our kids. We know where they're going. We know how fast they're driving. We know, uh, we, you know, some of us are checking their texts. Even sometimes they don't know it. And sometimes, uh, you know, we're, we're, we are so aware of everything that's going on in our family's lives. Why? Because we're good parents, right? And because we know, <laughs> right, right, sometimes... <laughs> But we also know that, that the people that they surround themselves with are going to have a great influence on the people that ultimately they become. Now, we, we understood this principle found in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be misled that bad company corrupts good character. That, that no matter what you do, as you're trying to raise your kids the right way, we know that sometimes the company they keep can corrupt the good character that you're trying to impart into their lives. Now, here's what I also know to be true. Every single one of us in this room, we have people that we surround ourselves with. Whether you're a parent, whether you're not a parent, whether you're single, whether you're, uh, you're a student, whatever the case may be, we all surround ourselves with people. And this principle written to a church in Corinth is the same principle for us today, that the people that we surround ourselves with ultimately will determine our 
character. It will determine our nature, it will determine the things. Even, no matter how good we are trying to be or want to be, ultimately, the people that we surround ourselves are going to be the people that we become more like. Uh, many of you can attest to that in your life or seasons in your life where you're, you're really passionate in your relationship with God and you started hanging out with people that, that just accepted you. And that's what you were looking for. That's all you were going for. It's like, I just need people to accept me. I want people to embrace me. I want people not to judge me. And so I get around these people and whatever passion that I had is offset by the lack of passion that they had. It's like when you take hot water and you take cold water and you mix it together, right? It becomes this warm, lukewarm water. And the, the principle for all of us is very, very true. The people that we surround ourselves ultimately are going to determine the direction of our lives. Hey, so it, it's kind of in our lives as we're looking at this and trying to figure out what, what that looks like. I want you to think about just right, right now, think about the three people in your life that you would say are these, are, the, these are the closest friends I have right now. Just think about who they are. Think about their name. Think about the, the, the character, think about their values, think about the things that they get excited about, things, things, things that they get passionate about, the things that they kind of think are meh, right? And one of the things that you'll discover almost every single time is this, that you become kind of a, an example, a, a blending of the people that you surround yourself with. And, and if you don't believe that, th think about the things that you decided to do just because you got around certain people. The, the things that you decided, hey, points along the way maybe in your life where you said, hey, I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to do this until I got around people who do this, right? I'm never, ever, ever going to act this way until I got around people who act this way. And, and I start finding myself in this place consistently where it's like I, and, and I'm like all of y'all, right? I, I want to be liked. I want people to, to accept me. I want people to embrace me. Uh, I, don't want, I don't like to have people not like me. I'm an extrovert, so, so it's easy for me to make relationships. But the downside of an extrovert is sometimes I get my feelings hurt if people don't want to be my friend. It's like, what, what's wrong with me? What's, did I do something wrong? Maybe, maybe I can tell a joke and be fun. You know, I try to figure out how to, how to make it right, right? And it's easy for all of us, though, to get caught up in that, that need and that desire for people to to want you to be a part of their crew, to be a part of their group. And, and the, the little secret that nobody talks about is that every single individual wants that same thing. And so these people that you're trying so hard to connect with, that you're trying so hard to be friends with, they're wanting the exact same things. They're looking for people in their lives who will be able to help them and, and make them hopefully better people. Or in some cases to make them uh, make them feel better about themselves and the bad choices that they are making. Proverbs chapter 12, verse uh, 26 says this. It says, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The righteous chooses their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked lead them astray. Now, Here's what we also know, right? We've all experienced this in life. Uh, when you have friends who don't care for themselves, they are not going to help you care for yourself. Right? If they don't care enough to take care of themselves, they're not going to be concerned about you taking care of yourself. If you have friends who don't take care of their marriages, if you've got friends who are not investing into their marriages, they will not look out for your marriage. If you have friends who are irresponsible with their finances, Man, we see this all the time, right? People who's like, hey, just, just buy that. I don't need it, but it's like, but it's on sale. Go ahead and buy it. And you're like, ah. But because my friends are here and I get pressured into buying stuff I don't need or stuff I don't want because they were like, oh, this will be great. This will look cute in your house. Oh, this will look great in, in your car. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and buy it. And we do things just because of the fact that our friends are encouraging us and, and pressuring us into doing these things. Friends who cheat. Uh, students, if you've got friends at school who cheat, they always feel better about themselves when you cheat, right? It's like they're, they're doing everything they can to say, hey, what, what's the answers? I, I'm not going to tell you the answers. Then you got to feel that weird pressure, right? It's like, how am I going to not give them the answer? They've asked for it, and they've asked for it nicely. And I want to be their friend, right? And friends who break the law aren't going to confront you about breaking the law. Friends who make poor choices aren't going to care if you make poor choices. In fact, they're going to want to try to drag you down and bring you down to the level to justify their choices. The righteous choose their friends carefully, 
And this righteous, this, it means that people who are wanting to, to be in the right standing with God, to be in the right relationship with God, people who are intentional in their relationship with God, they want to make sure that they are choosing the people that they surround themselves with carefully. Because if you take hot water and you take cold water, you get lukewarm water. If you take hot water and you have more hot water, it stays hot, right? And we need to surround ourselves with people who are going to help us and who are going to make us better. Uh, the fact of the matter is, when you start thinking about the, these friends of yours, who uh, some of them are, are really great friends who love Jesus, and some of them are people who are like, yeah, I, I can see every time I get around this guy or every time I get around this girl, my language changes a little bit. Uh, the things I joke about changes a little bit. Uh, I'm a little bit more lenient in uh, some of my morals and my values, some of the things that I consider to be important to me. Uh, I kind of let it slide a little bit more when I'm around them, right? Th these are the decisions that we, sometimes we have to make. And what I'm saying is this. If you've got friends who, who act like idiots, that's great, <laughs> right? It's good for all of us to need to have friends who act like idiots. Why? Because some of our friends have a friend who oftentimes act like an idiot, Right? And so it's good to have people in your life sometimes who, who aren't perfect and who don't always do it right. Uh, we're not looking for perfection, but we're looking for direction. We're looking for people who want to help us to move in the direction that ultimately will lead us to become the people that God has created us to be. And that doesn't happen by accident. It happens intentionally when we surround ourselves with people who are going to help us and to move us in this direction. Uh, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 20 says this, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. So, so here's, here's what we know to be true, right? When I surround myself with positive people, with people who have a positive outlook, people who, who are responding positively to circumstances, uh, even difficulties, I find that my response in those same circumstances tends to be positive, right? But if I surround myself with negative people who are always viewing everything negatively, who are always uh, looking at the world negatively, who always are pessimistic at everything that comes across the news wire, when I start to surround myself with those people, I begin to feel the same feelings, the same emotions that they begin to feel. And even again, a long time ago, I would say, oh, I'm a super positive person. I'm a super optimistic person. But if I surround myself with people who are consistently negative, who are gossips, people who are consistently putting other people down, people talking about other people behind their back, then I'm eventually, over time, I'm going to start to gravitate, even though I don't want to, even though I know deep down inside that it's wrong, I will tend to gravitate in that direction. Now, I would love it if every single one of us in this room would say, you know what, I'm not that person. I'm the person, I'm, I'm the person who raises the temperature. I'm the person who whenever they're going, they're going south, I'm the guy who says, no, 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 we need to take the high road. And if you're doing that, that's fantastic. And if you are a friend of somebody else who's, who's kind of wanting to pull you down and you're being the strong one and you're able to, to help walk them along and, and kind of raise them up, outstanding. But if you find people in your life who are consistently dragging you down, and it seems like every time you get around them, no matter how good your intentions are, you tend, you tend to kind of fall off the cliff, right? These are the people you need to say, you know what, I, I want to pray for them. And I want God's best for them. And I want to be salt and light to them. But I just can't be a friend. <laughs> we just can't be one of the core people that I'm around with. Because I'm not intentional in the direction that I want to go. I walk with people who are going to and this is where we have to make choices, right? Or some of the choices that we make become difficult. Because some of us have been around people who've been dragging us down for years. Find ourselves in this place where we're trying to figure out how do I not hang out with them as much as I used to. And some of the answer is very simple. And if you're in high school, you, you know this to be true. Uh, you just start hanging out with other people more often. And more often and more often and more often and more often. And over time, it begins to adjust your schedule. Now, here's the thing. We, we knew that back in high school. We knew that's kind of how that worked. We, maybe we didn't know it exactly, but we kind of picked up on it. That's how it works. That's why if you're a parent and you're a parent of a student, you know that on any given year, your, your students, your children have a new best friend, right? On any given year, it's like, yeah, I was best friends with so-and-so last year, but this year, because of the classes, because we're, you know, running in different circles, I'm best friends with these people now. Sometimes it's because of choices that we make, right? About choosing to be best friends with these people because I want to be accepted. Sometimes it's because, no, it just kind of happened naturally. 
What we're saying is walk with the wise and become wise. Make conscious choices in the friends that you surround yourself with, people that are going to help you to become the best possible version of you that you can be. And in the same respect, make sure that you're helping the people around you become the best version of themselves that they can be. Because if we're not, we'll get real selfish with this, right? I, I just want friends who will help me. I, I need help. I need help. I need help. I need you to help me. Everybody, everybody helps me, right? We need to make sure that we're people who are actually helping other people so that they can be people who are walking with wise people. Make sense? All right. Uh, this next section right here, this is, this is huge. This is, uh, this is big, and, and this is especially for those who are single uh, in the room. If you're single in the room, this is for you. Um, scripture in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 16 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, this idea of yoked together, it's, it carries with it. We, we talked about this multiple times, right? Uh, when oxen are put together and they're yoked together, this big giant wooden yoke that enables them to, to pull together. They're teamed up together, right? So, so do not be yoked together with unbelievers. And what this is saying is making sure that the, the people that you are investing in, even to the point of, of walking in the same direction with, uh, particularly when it comes to dating, when it comes to marriage, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who they love Jesus with all their heart and they think that he's hot, <laughs> Right? This guy is good looking and he likes me and he's into me. And so I'm just going to, I love Jesus. I really do. And this guy is, man, mm, mm, right? And so it's like, maybe, even though if he's not into Jesus right now, maybe if I dated him, then eventually he'll kind of come around. It's kind of missionary dating, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm really just serving the Lord this way. By going out with this guy, and not just guy, we're going out with this girl, right? I'm, I'm serving the Lord by going out with this girl or guy who is uh, not interested in a relationship with Jesus, but they're interested in a relationship with me. And, and so we find ourselves in this place where it's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to date, we're going to date, we're going to date, and, we're gonna, and one day. And here's, here's the truth, okay? There, there's a story out there. There's a couple of stories out there of people that you know or someone who knew somebody who knew somebody who it worked perfectly for. Where it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, they didn't know the Lord. And then this person was so passionate about Jesus and brought them along. And eventually they came to faith in Christ. And now they're both loving Jesus together. And it's this great relationship, right? With every one of those stories, there's a hundred other stories of people that I meet with on a somewhat regular basis who come to me and say, you know what? My husband, my spouse, my wife has no interest in spiritual things. And I'm trying to figure out how do we in this divided household how do we work together? Our values are completely different, completely opposite. The new and the shiny has worn off, right? Uh, it's not a matter of, oh, man, we're just so interested in each other and so in love with each other. Now it's we have these totally separate values. Now kids are starting to come into the picture. How do we raise our kids? And our kids are growing up in this divided household trying to figure out, well, well mom goes to church, but dad doesn't even believe in God. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? Again, I'm not saying don't love people who are living in darkness. I'm saying make sure that you are shining the light of Christ to them, that you're showing them what it looks like to have a relationship with God, showing them what it looks like to be somebody who's, who's living out the purpose that God has created for them, and don't bring them alongside into a romantic relationship. It goes on, it says, what harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? Now, some of you may think that your spouse or your ex-spouse is the devil. That's not what this passage is saying. He's saying the followers of Jesus, the people who have the value system of the kingdom. He said, what do these people have in common with people whose value system is of the world? Over time, the new wears off and it's not quite as cool anymore. And you start to live out your values and what you'll find is over time, those values will drive you in different directions. Or bad company will corrupt good character. And the passion that you once had, this hot water, gets mixed with the cold water long enough. And eventually you just become impassionate about your relationship with God. 
trying to make sure that this thing works, trying to figure out how to raise kids in this environment. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? He says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. See, it isn't just a matter of my decisions and my choices. And it's like, well, what am I? I may never get married if I don't marry this person. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's a possibility. I mean, there's no promise in Scripture that everyone gets married. There is a promise in Scripture that everyone will live the life that God has created for them to live as long as they walk with him and as long as they commit themselves to him. But I don't want to miss this. If this pulls you away from your relationship with God, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. So, where can we go? How can we do this better? How can we be better equipped to be people who are surrounding ourselves with wise people? Uh, realizing that every single one of us will go through circumstances in our life where we have to make the choices. Every single one of us will go through places and seasons in our life where we will have to determine whether or not they're going to do something. Every single one of us will have to be uh, people who make a decision on whether we're choosing to walk with God and choosing to embrace his plan and his purpose for our lives or choosing to live our lives in a way that ultimately will drive us far away from him. Uh, scripture says this, A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. So the first step is you need to be a friend who loves people well, right? Because, again, there's other people in your life who are looking for people who are going to help them grow and help them to become everything that they created to be. So you need to make sure that you're loving them and searching for ways to, to be a loving friend, to be a kind friend, to be a friend who's always pointing people to Christ and to the gospel and to who Jesus ultimately is. And so when you're living that out, you're going to find that you're going to be surrounded by people who are living that out. That, that more and more people who were passionate and moving that direction, it, it, it's this beautiful way that the, the gospel and the church kind of magnet, magnetizes and, and draws towards one another in these circumstances. But if you're not looking for it, if you're not looking for people who, who are going to pursue Christ with everything they have, then you're going to have a hard time being that kind of a person for them as well. You're going to have a hard time having a, a circle of friends, a, a, a car full of HOV companions who are going to help you to get to the place where God wants you to be. And when we make choices in these, these places along the way, it's, it's amazing how God will meet us in these moments. I remember growing up um, as a 16-year-old. I'd just got in my car, right? Just got in my car. And I had a friend of mine um, who had uh, just gotten his car, and so we were good friends. And um, and my car was this 1977 Ford LTD, right? And if you, anybody, some of y'all don't even know what that is. Uh, but there's, there's, back in the day, there is this land barge, right? I mean, it was as wide as the stage. I mean, I could lay down in the front seat, right? I mean, it was this huge, huge monster vehicle. It was light blue. It was my dad's car. I was 16. I was excited because, it, I mean, it had a V8 engine. I, I could... I could cruise down the highway, super awesome, smooth suspension. My friend, he had a little Mazda, right? It was quick, it was fast, it was powerful. He tried to trick it out a little bit, but, uh, but, but I knew ultimately that the land barge, that I could take him anytime, right? <laughs> I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be first off the line, but I knew that over a period of time that I, man, I, I would take him. And so we, we just got to talking and trash talking towards one another. And his car, by the way, let me just say, his car was super cool, <laughs> Right? And I just was making up things about my car, trying to figure out how to make it cool, because it was not cool at all. Uh, but, but it was smooth, and it was something that I could drive. And at 16 years old, it's like, that's all you're looking for, right? And so, uh, so anyway, so we were talking trash to one another, and eventually he gets to a place where he's like, hey, you want to race? And in, in my mind, in my mind, I'm going, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> that is a stupid idea. Uh, and so I'm like, well, let's maybe not race, right? Let me play chase, Right? And so we decide we're going to play chase, and so he takes off, and then I start chasing him, right? And again, and I would never do this like in normal life unless my friend pulled me this way, uh, of course. And so anyway, so he's driving, and I'm just catching up with him. And over a period of time, it's like slowly, slowly, 
we're on this, this deserted road, right? There's nobody around. I'm being super safe, right? And so anyways, so he's going, he's going fast, but I'm slowly, slowly, slowly catching up until I see his, head, his uh, taillights. And as soon as his taillights hit and he turns the corner. And in that moment, I'm like, oh, no. Because I'm in the land barge. And I will not turn that corner nearly as quickly as he will. And as soon as I slammed on my brakes, and I'm just like, and finally end up into the ditch, coming up, keep going, right? Just <laughs> finally back over on the edge. And in my mind, I'm just like, whoo, man, that was close. So I get out of the car, check out the damage. And my front fender was crumpled up. And my bumper was kind of pushed in a little bit. And there was mud all up underneath the bumper in the fender well. And in that moment, I'm thinking, I'm about to die. I probably would have done better just to have died in the accident. So, you know, fortunately, there's interior damage. Finally, you know, and uh, when I get home, I have a choice. I lie about that. That's right. Come clean. You know, my dad was 16. And I come clean. Tell me. And so I went into the house and I said, Father, <laughs> allow me to share with you the events of this evening. <laughs> you see, I was driving down the road recklessly, as a 16 year old oftentimes will do. And I found myself in a position where I was chasing a friend of mine. No, I didn't do that. I lied. I lied. I lied through my teeth. And I, was, I tried everything, trying to figure out ways to make it look like it was this weird freak accident, right, where somebody cut me off and I had to peel off into the ditch and everything. And, and so I'm trying to figure out how to get this convincing lie over across my dad. And uh, I worked on it a couple of times before I got there and finally get there. And it's like, yeah, and so I'm done. <sighs> but at least I'm okay, right? And he says, huh. So he goes out there and looks at the car. Hmm. Comes back in. So what happened? I mean, what really happened? <laughs> what do you mean? And, you know, I'm, in my mind as a 16-year-old, I'm not thinking, oh, he's so much older than me, and he knows me, and he knows everything. <laughs> he knows what it's like to be me, right? Uh, and he actually knows what's going on and kind of can figure out what's going on with the vehicle. And, all. and so I'm like, I, and so it's like, well, okay, it's time to come clean. No, I come up with another lie, like on the spot, like in the moment, trying to think, oh, here's another way to maybe get around this, right? And so he's like, oh, that's great. That's incredible. So what really, really happened, right? And so finally come clean and tell him what really happened. And, and it was like, oh, man, so it's, he says, why did you do that? He's like, well, I just, I don't know. I just did it. As a parent, don't you hate that? That's like the worst, right? It's like, I don't know. It's like, what do you mean you don't know? You actually intentionally thought about this and you actually did that, right? Here's the thing. My friend, he was gone. <laughs> he was not there with me. He was not there to take the rap with me. He was not there to help explain it with me. He was not there to walk me through this season of having to talk to my dad about this. He was long gone. And guys, we need people with us. We need people who at the very beginning will say, hey, let's not do this. Let's, let's not go this direction. But more than that, we need people who walk with us and stick with us and walk beside us even in the midst of difficult seasons, even in the midst of difficulty. A friend will love at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. We need men and women in our lives who are going to help us become the best possible version of ourselves, the person that God has created us to be. And it will not come by accident. It will become because we make the choice. Jesus put it this way in John 15, 13. He says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus knew, ultimately, that he would have to lay down his life for his friends. He says, this is what love looks like. That you're willing to put it all on the line. And that's what he did for us. 
In fact, the way that we live out the life that God has created us to live is simply to be people who recognize that Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, laid down his life for his friends and he considers us to be friends. That he was willing to do everything necessary to stand with us, to to die for us. And, And by taking our sin upon himself on that cross, he died in our place and he paid the penalty for our sin so that we could have a relationship with God, so that we could live the lives that we were created to live, so that we could be the people that God wanted us to be. We could know what life is. We could know what love is. We could experience the joy of surrounding ourselves with family and brothers and sisters in Christ who will help us because we can't do this alone. We can't do any of this alone. Now, as we close out our time in prayer, I'm going to ask the band if they'll make their way back up. But as we close out our time, I want to just in this moment have everyone just close your eyes and bow your head. And I want you to think about, remember those three people that we talked about, these three friends that you surround yourself with. I want you to think in this moment, are they people who help you? Are they people who build you up, who encourage you, who point you in the right direction? Are there people who pull you away? And for some of them, it may be, hey, we, we need to have a serious conversation together, right? Where you get to share what your values are and where you really want to be headed. For some of you, you'll be shocked that that's kind of where they want to go too, but they just didn't have anybody that was going that same direction that they were scared to live out their values. And what a beautiful thing that could be if you could make a recommitment as a friendship to move in the same direction. But some of us in this room, there's, there's some people who have been a constant for years, constantly pulling us back away from the Lord. And maybe the first step for us is simply to figure out how do I, how do I choose a new community of people? who will be my friends, who will help point me to Jesus. We have life groups that can help and move in that direction. We have a community that we're trying to develop in men's and women's Bible studies to kind of help challenge and encourage and sharpen each other. And maybe that first step for you is to be able to get involved in one of these small group environments. You're able to, to talk with other people who are going through the same struggles and the same difficulties to take that next step. And maybe one or two of you in this room, maybe your first step is simply to say yes to Jesus. Father, thank you for life. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us. Um, As the ushers come forward to receive our morning offering, I pray that you would use this to uh, bless your kingdom. I pray that the work that we do in this community and in this region and in the world would glorify you and honor you. Thank you for generous generosity and the people that you've given to this church who uh, believe in the ministry here. And I, I pray that you would allow all of us, God, to, to be people who encourage others to walk the walk with Christ and to find people in our lives who will support us and help us and push us and make us become better people. Uh, we love you. We need you to do that in us as the weeks progress. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.